Pencil, online. HPG connection, online. Educational module, online. All systems, nominal. Hello, class, and welcome to On the Origin of Battlemex podcast, episode 24. Today, we are talking about the Fire Bee. I am your host, Brent Stewart McKee. My co hosts today are. I'm Joshua. And I'm Chandler. And today, we are talking about the Fire Bee. As is tradition, the Capellans were last of the great houses to secure the Battlemex technology. They were able to secure the information from the Free Worlds League, and the information they secured was on the Icarus One. This can be read about in the Proliferation Cycle, the Spider Dance. I highly recommend. It. It's a really good story. After the... Okay, I'm not actually ha- sure how to pronounce this. Maskarovka. Maskarova, okay. After the Maskarova burned slash sacrificed an entire team to get the plans into Capellan hands, the Chancellor Jasmine Liao ordered a 10-year plan retooling their economy and scientific community to support the production and manufacture of battle mechs on a interstellar scale. The actual battle mech project was headed by the company Lyrutin Design Bureau on Tokno. The design philosophy was to build a light mobile strike mech that could overtake armor and overwhelm larger battle mechs with numbers. The team developed a number of prototype designs as Weapon Armed Mech Alpha or Wham A. Wham, wham, wham. Wham. <laughs> so it's got the design quirks of a poor life support system and weak legs. And it looks really good. I think the art for this thing is sweet. It's got like a really good action pose. I especially like the wham art. Just the shading is a little more fleshed out and I think it makes it pop a little bit more. Yeah, it's it's cool. It feels very transformer to me it does that's totally fair Capellans transform <laughs> i mean it definitely has a cockpit head you know yeah the head almost looks like a, a you know an insect like a grasshopper bug not the mm-hmm. grasshopper mech but an actual grasshopper bug the dual antennas really yep this guy is interesting because he's all missiles yeah just a real light missile boat short range for the most part three srm twos an lrm five giving him a little bit of range there he has a movement profile of five eight and ten heat sinks and it's a 35 ton mech it's primitive everything so that five eight while really good for this early primitive era is quite poor for what we'd expect a 35 ton mech to be doing in the future yeah see now the interesting thing about this is the record sheet lists it as the wham b but it doesn't list a battle value and on master unit list the wham b and frb dash one e are listed as the same machine so i believe technically the wham b record sheet is actually record sheet for the wham a interesting i'm not a hundred percent on that but that is what i think has happened because according to master unit list there is no record sheet for the wham a Mm -hmm. but it does list it because if you read tro 3075 the wham b was renamed to the fire b because a commentator observing it was a propaganda piece really yeah when a wham b used inferno missiles to wipe out an entire company of tanks in this propaganda video the commentator embedded reporter was like that's not a wham b that's a fire b mm-hmm. and that's why they renamed it so the wham b and the fire b one e are the same mech so there's no reason for the record sheets to be different but if the b and the e are the same mech then they wouldn't have different movement profiles files and the one e has a four six and the record sheet for the b has a five eight i've got them having the exact same stats so if they're five eight for both of them interesting i pulled mine from primitives volume three and 3075 age of war unabridged maybe the 461 is supposed to be the wham a and it's just a misprint no it's just an interesting thing i noticed that i figured we should talk about now circling back to the uh, wham a real quick because we do have some historical notes if not a record sheet it was first seen in tests in 2472 and this model has several weapon loadouts all centered around proven missile weapon systems to ensure reliable and reduced 
reduced development time. The model was selected for improvements and was centered around the SRM system. This main model's shortcoming was a lack of speed, resulting in this model not being rejected, but with a, an acceptance after refinement. And of course, we already discussed how it doesn't have a listing on anything. So that brings us forward to the WAM-B or FRB-1E, and it was seen in 2483 and first known as the WAM-A as we discussed, so I'm not going to walk over the ground Josh has already covered. It has the design quirks of being difficult to maintain, an extended torso twist, non-standard parts, poor workmanship, weak legs, and it was obsolete in 2524. It's got a bow value of 514 and a point value of 15. Following up the 1E, you get the 2 e which was introduced in 2524 to replace i'm assuming the one e seeing as they don't overlap but they very closely follow each other mm -hmm. this one definitely is an upgrade at the very least oh yeah it ditches all of the primitive tech ditches the lrm and puts a large laser on there for its long range weaponry and also giving it a weapon that doesn't require ammo so it can actually just keep fighting no matter how much ammo it needs it can just keep going and it adds a jump capability of five mm -hmm. yes um i actually prefer the artwork for this one with the exception of that large laser gun hand <laughs> yeah i really feel the cylinder arm works a lot better aesthetically than the pseudo hand gun thing it's got going on there yeah the handgun thing can work we see it work on other mechs it's just weirdly proportioned and at odd angles on this one yeah it just kind of juts up a little bit if it just stayed flat it would look better i think or even if it came back further so there was a balance on the back of it visually mm -hmm. the head the cockpit still has a very humanoid head the faceplate's the same but it it went to a single antenna, so it looks less insect-like now and looks more like a, an alien warrior, which I think is why I prefer the artwork for this one. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, it also bumps the armor up a little bit. So in the switch over to standard armor from the primitive of the 1E, you do get another, what is that, 7... 17 points? No. No, 27. 27. Yeah, 27 points of armor, which is a pretty significant increase for a mech of its size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you go from 69 points to 96. Yeah, that's not bad at all. But I think the real upgrade that I like the most is the large laser, because as we mentioned, not having the ammo. Also, it doesn't have a minimum range, and that's nice, especially since you can shoot it and the SRMs if you just need to make sure something dies. Yeah. Yes, but at the same time, it does not have the heat capacity. It still yeah. only has 10 heat sinks. Now you've got that large laser pumping out eight heat. You have four SRM2s now instead of three. You know that at least the 1E could fire most, if not all, of its weapons without overheating now this fire b 2e has to really really manage its heat yeah and i definitely feel like the point of the srms isn't to be i'm going to punch a hole and then find the holes with the uh, srms it's definitely a i'm gonna load this thing with infernos disable you and then shoot you to part with the large laser later mm -hmm. we're gonna work in a pack to take you down and overheat you yeah yeah it does have two tons of srm ammo so it can carry one ton of inferno and then one ton of standard which i think as much as you like the large laser brent i think the srm2s are still the main weapon on this fire b mm -hmm. because that little bit of ammo flexibility and the sheer multitude of launchers really allows this guy to play a support role to infantry and tanks but especially infantry by hammering enemy emplacements with just a <laughs> load of really heavy missile launchers or really heavy missiles I don't disagree with you. I just think the large laser is a little better suited because of the lack of minimum range. Yeah, over the LRMs. The heat is a significant trade-off, but, you know, to each their own. I'd almost want to trade the jump just for another two heat sinks and slap on some extra armor. Yeah, just to keep it in the fight a little bit more without having to worry about heat. As an infantryman, I'd rather be supported by the 1E because he can be quite a ways away and I can go, hey, I need a fire support mission. And he doesn't even have to be in line of sight. He can send that LRM-5 raining down missiles on the enemy building that I'm taking fire from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, gameplay wise, the 2E, not even counting the benefits from going from primitive to standard tech, is just a better design because of the large laser. Yes, in classic battle tech. But I think there'll be something for you in the near future, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>
So the FRB-2E was mass-produced in 2524 during the reign of Calvin Liao. This model would work out many of the kinks the previous model had. Its speed is competitive even to today. The addition of the large laser increased its reach, as we talked about, and the armor gives a good protection for its tonnage. The only real complaint was from green mech warriors who didn't understand the benefit of being able to load out your mech with infernos and SRMs. And as we've discussed, that is a really good thing to have, especially if you're able to coordinate as a unit to take something down. So I'm curious, you said the speed is competitive to modern mechs, but this is still a 35 tonner that's only going 86 kilometers an hour at, at top speed. So I, I'm not sure why, wait, what you mean by competitive. Uh, it was taken right from the TRO. <laughs> well, the TRO is wrong in this situation. Like, our, look, our TRO is out of date. <laughs> you also got to remember the Fire B is not designed to be a scout mech or anything. It's designed to be, you know, used en masse to mm-hmm. just form things down. Compare it to a commando, which oh, is... No, yeah. And the commando is a different design philosophy that it does a very similar task, but it does it differently. You have a commando with the same missile loadout. Maybe it has two less tubes because it's got an SRM-6 and a large laser. Mm-hmm. It goes 6-9 instead of 5-8. But this is also much more armored. Yeah, this thing's almost edging into like medium mech territory. Whereas I mean, the commando is more of a light mech really trying to punch up its weight class. I mean, yes, but you're still, I don't know. Uh, you're so slow. Speed is armor. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I don't know, I just don't like a 35-ton mech that has the same movement profile as a 55-ton mech. I mean, it's also a different proposition when it's one on the battlefield versus a pack of them moving together. True. And, you know, it's interesting to note that they quickly became a primary target on the battlefield because of the SRMs and everything, so that's why they're not super common today. <laughs> It has a battle value of 808 and a point value of 18. Next, we have the Fire B3E. Who would have thought, you know, going from one to two to three? This one is much later in design. It is originally introduced in 3071 during the Jihad? Mm -hmm. 3071, Mm -hmm. yeah, Jihad. Yep. And it is a definite rework of the original 2E and 1E, where you still have your 5-8 movement, ditches the jump, though, gets you double heat sinks in there, so you're not going to have as much of a heat issue as you used to have. Mm -hmm. It does put a small cockpit in it, so you get a little bit more weight savings. Extra light gyro for more weight savings. Uses standard internals stealth armor and then for weapons you get your plasma rifle for your heat so you're still a fire bee you're still heating people up and you're also shooting them real good now and then you Mm -hmm. get your mml5 so you can get your trademark at srm infernos and then you also can choose either lrms or some other mo type to complement it Mm -hmm. well you'd have to choose one or the other because it's only got standard lrms and srms so you can't have both but well so technically it's it's just two tons of mml ammo you could put yeah a ton of SRM Inferno mm-hmm. and a ton of standard SRM. Mm-hmm. But you'd be sacrificing one of them is what I'm saying. Yeah. And with the MML5, it's probably worth it to sacrifice the LRM because since it's essentially just an LRM5. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have your plasma rifle for a really heavy long range punch. Yeah. And you definitely want to close with the loadout that this has. And this also has a Guardian ECM suit to make that stealth armor work. Yeah. Which I think that that Guardian ECM and the stealth armor are what makes the 5.8 movement profile tolerable in the 3E because you're not, even though you're not getting that additional defensive modifier from being a proper 6.9 or 7.11 light mech, you at least have the stealth armor to be given you that plus one at medium range and plus two at long range to mm-hmm. kind of make up for it. Yeah. And then when you're in, a, you know, clustered with a bunch of other allied mechs, you can keep that ECM suite active to help dissuade stuff like Artemis missiles and other things that would be affected by ECM. Mm -hmm. And your 10 double heat sinks is almost enough to allow you to fire the plasma rifle and the MML5 while being under stealth, but not quite. You can do the plasma rifle or the MMLs, but not both, unless you want to gain about three heat. Mm-hmm. three to five which isn't too bad you just kind of switch on and off another argument i think for srms over lrms in both your ammo bins is that way you're not tempted to fire the lrms and the plasma rifles at long range while you're under stealth yeah because once you close in the stealth doesn't really do anything for you and so then you'd want to shut it off to keep the heat savings and then you also get a mess up whatever technology they got going with that ecm yeah i think it's a really well balanced machine very capellan <laughs> it's just a shame that there's only 
only two of these units that are known about, and both were retrofit slash upgrades that happened in 3071 as mentioned to symbolize the never-ending circle that is the Chancellorship. These units incorporated all of the iconic Capellan Confederation tech, but they had to remove the jump jets to fit it all, as we mentioned. One of the units was gifted to Sowei Heather Cole, and it has a battle value of 1067 and a point value of 29. That stealth armor really pushing up its cost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Sowei Heather Cole, why did she get one of the two, three E's ever created? Well, she's actually one of our notable pilots for our pilot profiles. So let's just swing right into that. She is a member of the Red Lancers and is notable for being a part of the search party that located Sun Tzu Liao while he was trapped after the bombardment of Cyan. In gratitude, or Whitworth was replaced with the retrofitted Fire Bee with the political spotlight on her and her family connections it's believed that she's going to be a rising star that will accomplish something what that is remains to be seen yeah i believe that bombardment of sion was one of the opening moves of the word of blake during the jihad well they basically attacked all the capitals basically in unison yep. yeah and um i think sion the capital of the capellan confederation got it especially hard because sun Tzu was the first lord of the star league and responsible for the dissolution of the second star league right before the word of blake was voted in as a member of the star league which really upset them as we've mentioned they kind of pitched a fit over that yeah they pitched a fit that turned into the jihad we are after all trying to be family friendly right yes <laughs> you don't want to try out our cool new sound effects <laughs> <laughs> so our next pilot is captain ipsen chang oh Oh, they did not. Captain Ip Sin Chang, the Ip Man. Oh, wow. That flew right over my head. Uh, I don't get it. A series of movies. Oh. Yeah. He piloted the first 2E off the production line and accumulated a very impressive service record, having confirmed kills on many tanks and countless squads of infantry, and has taken down half a dozen battle mechs. He was the most famous first gen pilot in the Capellan Confederation. The fame went to his head and he quickly started to overindulge. That would eventually become fatal after being found in bed with a married woman. It is disputed if Chang was fully aware of the situation, but I believe he was, or he was incredibly stupid. He was executed by burning by the use of Inferno Gel by Kevin Liao after Kevin learned of his wife's infidelity. That's a way to go. Okay. <laughs> Very Targaryen. Yeah. And possibly a nod to the Ip Man. Mm -hmm. Which is a good set of movies. Very enjoyable. Yeah, so that's the Fire Bee. Very angry. Very fiery. Don't get too close. It might light you on fire. Or murder you. One of the two. Or both. Both? Both. Both is good. Both, both is good. So for our data dive today, we're going to talk about the Capellan Confederation. So I'm going to throw over to Chandler for this guy. For today's data dive, we're going to start with the formation of the Capellan Confederation. And this will be the start of a series of data dives that go into the formation of all of the different great houses and uh, periphery states. And we'll probably end up expanding into notable organizations like, let's say, Comstar. And mercenaries. Mercenaries. So Wolf's Dragoons, Calhouns, you name it, and they're important, they'll probably show up eventually. I hear bagpipes. Yes, bagpipes in the distance. I don't know why. Someone check on that. So with the Capellan Confederation, the story starts in 2310 with the formation of the Capellan Co Commonality, which is a direct result of the Capellan Hegemony and Sarna Supremacy War, which is a whole nother mess that doesn't really matter for the formation of the Capellan Confederation, other than it forms the Capellan Commonality. This was a very democratic uh, nation and was... What went wrong? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> so, so with its formation, it allowed the voting in its government by not just people who lived in the Capellan com Commonality, but pe anyone who lived in the Capellan Zone, which is pretty much an area that turned into the Capellan Confederation. And this would elect the prime minister, who was essentially your head of state. However, this kind of fell apart with internal corruption and foreign meddling, because, you know, who would have thought the other states would not mess with this? I, me, I totally didn't see it coming. And by 2366, you have fewer than five percent of the possible voters voting which is not any good sign for any sort of democratic system whatsoever whether it's a state 
or a bunch of kids in a classroom trying to decide what movie they're watching today. A democracy requires an engaged citizenship. And 5% is about as far from engaged as you can get without people just not caring at all. At some point, if you're a local and you're being outvoted by people who are being bussed in, so to speak, you know, your vote has no meaning, so why bother? Yeah. Apathy is a powerful force. Revolution is better. And so in the midst of a House Davian peacekeeping, in air quotes, because House Davian and peacekeeping is a uh, euphemism. It's a euphemism for invasion. The heads of the major Capellan Zone powers met on St. Andre in July of 2367. And then there, Duke Franco Liao, so we get House Liao, you know, muscling in on this, finally, who was in charge of the Duchy of Liao, made the proposal to dissolve the commonality and unify the entire zone into a new central authority, which was supposed to be very centralized, and be able to oppose foreign powers, which, if you read between the lines, pretty much means we're going to go full dictator on this bad boy and punch anyone who says otherwise. Well, centralizing power is a general authoritarian move. Yeah. And after much debate, the motion was adopted and the compelled confederation was born. Ta-da! Gender reveal. It's green. <laughs> 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 and it burns the original... down the local area <laughs> ironically <laughs> yes so uh the original capital of the confederation capella was almost immediately bombarded as part of all of this because house davian had landed a number of mech units on it and after the capellans told them to surrender because they had captured the space around the planet they had said no because they're davian and they bombarded the planet to tell them that they didn't have a choice and they all died and it killed a lot of new confederation citizens and this is also the reason why you have the black border on the compelling confederation flag as a memorial to to those confederation citizens who died in that bombardment at the very beginning of the confederation's existence i did not know that yeah I, I vaguely remember that and i find it kind of ironic because it doesn't symbolize the rest of the capellan confederations citizens that have died at the hands of the capellan government just yeah. the ones at the beginning you just the gotta remember this before everything went full you know maximilian liao we're all crazy this is still, we're cunning and... Early good intentions. Yeah, well, good intentions maybe not, but definitely early and not insane. Also, a symbol to unify a people is a powerful thing. Yes. So you're saying that the Capellan Confederation is hell because the road to hell is paved with good intentions? <laughs> I'd say the Inner Sphere in general is hell, but... <laughs> War is hell. <laughs> War is hell, boys. So, with the Capellan Confederation's birth, they secured their borders and developed and expanded slowly under the House Liao banner. This did eventually bring them in direct conflict with the Free World's League, which was the oldest of the Great Houses, at least at the time. Now, not so much. Over the status of Endurian, which was a disputed area on the borders of the Free World's League and the Capellan Confederation. And this started the First Endurian War, which touched off the Age of War, which uh, eventually leads leads up to the formation of the Star League. So the Capellans are to blame for the Age of War as well? Essentially, the First Endurian War kind of kicks off. It's like this first spark, and then everyone's like, you know, let's just shoot each other. So you're saying the, the Capellans are the cat on the table, and everyone's like, don't push the glass off the table. Uh, don't push the glass off the table. Uh, don't. Uh, crash. All right. <laughs> yes, but no one's telling them not to. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's just kind of like, eh. <laughs> whatever and then someone they finally knock it over and everyone's like well i guess i'll knock over my class too and this is also the start of all the bad blood between the free world's league and the compelling federation and then eventually the star league forms and compelling confederation does its thing that is the beginning of the compelling confederation before they go all maximilian loud crazy and back when they were merely trying to stave off the dirty hands of foreign intervention whether it's from the davians or from other pows they are the you know geographically smallest of the successor states depending on how you want to count the Russell Hag Republic did we want to talk about how they are now like what their status is now where they are right now is they're actually on the march they have been gobbling up former Republic territory and they have been securing their borders and being very aggressive yes but not too aggressive they're not pulling a uh, Karita let's go try to eat all of the Federated Sons in one go mm -hmm. they're being smart about it they're definitely yes. securing their borders they are arguably the strongest great house right now. Well, definitely top two. 
I would yeah. say they are undisputedly the house that has gained the most from this opportunity. Yes. The uh, the Battletech devs have stated several times on recent podcasts over at WNRP that House Liao and the Capellan Confederation are the most dangerous of, of the houses, at least to the Republic of the Sphere. They have the biggest military that's in position to do anything. They have leadership that's actually competent, still kind of egomaniacal, but at least it's competent now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Republic of Spheres got Ego Maniac Claw and Lock too, so it's not like they're the only ones. That is a commodity that no government has in Monopoly. <laughs> Like, everybody's got something hamstringing them behind the scenes. Yes. So, our sources for today are Sarna, Battletech Battle Mech Manual, Master Unit List, TRO Primitives Volume 3, TRO and RS Succession Wars, TRO 3075, RS 3075 Age of War Unabridged. Also, Handbook House Liao and Era Digest Age of War. We are supported by our Patreons at patreon.com backslash on the origin of battle mechs. Our social media on Twitter is at origin of mechs. We also have a dedicated channel on the Everything Battletech Discord. Feel free to stop by and say hi. If you have any questions, requests for topics, or wish to contact us, our email is on the origin of battle mechs at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, I encourage you to let your friends know about us and to leave a review. Special thanks to my friend Laura for the intro and outro. Class dismissed. Everybody have a great day. Peace out, mech warriors. Stay safe out there. Module complete. System standby. Would you like to load the next module? I thought someone was joining. No, it was just Craig. Craig's someone. We established that before. Oh, yes. It's just a shame he doesn't say hello. Mm-hmm. Hello. Craig, I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No worries. <laughs>